Okay, now I'm going to ask you a very broad question here. Good God, what went wrong? Yeah, I think, Mike, uh, you know, we're, we're at a point right now where there are so many more questions than answers. And as you pointed out, we're just coming up on one week ago. I mean, it was last Saturday at 6, 12 p.m. that the former president and current presidential candidate um, came under fire from someone about 130 yards away perched on top of a of a rooftop um, with full view of the of of the candidate and it's it's unconscionable and and I heard you mention in the wind up to this um, about the secret service director and 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 how she is taken responsibility and yet deflected and kind of distracted away from what appear to be a colossal set of cascading systems failures here um, I cannot imagine how something of this magnitude, and I understand it's not a national special security event. It's not akin to the, the RNC in, in Milwaukee where the resources are plentiful and abundant. There's hundreds of police agencies that are all integrated. There are tabletop exercises, field training exercises running up to it. That's not what this was. This was a former president. It looks like there was a paucity of resources from the federal side of this. They're forced to integrate with the local community, the Pennsylvania State Police, as well as the Butler Township Police. But Mike, you, you called it this when the when the independent review of this is conducted and the FBI conducts a review of this, there are going to be a set of colossal failures that never, ever, ever should have happened here. OK, now I, I want to back up just a little bit because you, you, you made an important point. Uh, you referenced national security events. And the fact that this was not one, this was this was a campaign event. Two things. Could you explain to to our audience uh, sort of the process involved? You get a national security event like the RNC that's that's been going on. Uh, but also as a sidebar here, do you know or have you heard of at what point this campaign rally that took place in Pennsylvania on Saturday? At what point was that put on the calendar as an event for the Secret Service? Sure. So as being the FBI senior team leader in the New York City division uh, back in 2004, 20 years ago this upcoming month, I was the tactical response team leader for the Republican National Convention that was held at Madison Square Garden. That was something that we planned out in advance over a year. So we worked hand in glove with the Secret Service, with the New York City Police Department, with the New York State Police, and a whole host of federal, state, and other local police departments to prep for that. And as you pointed out, it's an NSSE, a National Special Security Event. These are things that resources are not an issue. They're, they're major, major events. I've said to people that have been asking me about this all week, Milwaukee's Fiserv Center right now, where the RNC is going on, is the safest place to be on Earth. That is in direct opposite, polar opposite end of Butler, Pennsylvania on Saturday. And why was that? I don't know for certain, but having been involved in dignitary protection, I worked on three attorney general's details, Janet Reno's, John Ashcroft's, and Alberto Gonzalez's. And I worked protecting two FBI directors, uh, uh, Director Mueller and Director Free. Something like this, where you're dealing with a candidate who's conducting a whistle-stop tour, they probably got information that he was going to Butler, Pennsylvania a week or less in advance. Now, that's no excuses. Um, it's no excuse that somebody could have been able to access a rooftop 130 yards away. That's unconscionable. It's no excuse that the site advance plan did not put that place into play, meaning if they didn't have a drone over the top of it or they didn't control access to the top of it, there should have been somebody on top of it. So colossal failure there, but I will give the service the benefit of the doubt that this was not something planned far in advance where there were times to coordinate it and get the necessary resources. There were a paucity of resources there, and it's probably something, Mike, that got put on the calendar a few days, if not a week or so in advance. Okay. Now, Okay, I, I think, yeah, that, that is logical. That makes perfect sense, and it's just the way that it works. But uh, is it fair to say that, fine, you've got a resource issue when you're talking about a short time fuse for an event, right, like, a, like the event in, in Pennsylvania compared to a national security event. But 
on the operational side, you've got protocols in place, right? So not to oversimplify it, but every event you tend to step through, and correct me, please correct me if I'm wrong, you tend to step through the same methodology, right? You, you do the same things over and over again, which in part is why, why you know, uh, this can be such a mind-numbing business because of the repetitive nature of it. But that also means that you are stepping through certain things every time to create your security plan for that particular event. Oh, no doubt. And the five paragraph military operations order applies. It applied when I was in SWAT. It applied when I was on the FBI's hostage rescue team. It applied when I worked overseas with Joint Special Operations Command. It applies. Situation, mission, execution, administration, and command and control. In this instance, it's going to be easy. And this is the this is the typical thing that comes out of every single hot wash or uh, after action review um, that was conducted after an operation, whether it was a training mission or whether it was a real life crisis incident. And there's always gonna be complaints about communication. And people said to me, well, Jimmy, why couldn't the counter snipers from the, from the Secret Service speak to the police officers that were on the ground? Mike, you know as well as I do. In an operation like this, there were probably six or seven, maybe eight different frequencies. You're going to have a command frequency. You're going to have your state police on one frequency, your local police on another frequency. The counter sniper team is on one. The counter assault team's on another. Um, the protection detail, the body people that were up on the stage, they're going to be on another. Now, yes, you have to have liaisons that go through the command post or the joint operations center and get that real-time information. Hey, there's a guy up on the roof. We think he has a gun. How does that not get translated where it needs to get to and passed along? That is the fog of war. And brother, I know you've been in some hairy places in your life, as I certainly have. And it is the fog of war. We know that there were some 90 seconds before some of the video shows where people were pointing out where the sniper was on the roof before the Secret Service actually was able to engage him after he had already fired off eight shots of 556 five, at the head of a former president. Unconscionable, but again, it's going gonna, it's gonna to probably come down to fog of war, communication issues, and maybe to your point at the top of this, were there any flaws with the site planning? Did they look at that rooftop as not a threat or not as something that needed to be owned? Look, let's go back to December of 1963. The Secret Service realized then that somebody up in a book depository could take shots at an open air convertible that the President of the United States was traveling in in Dallas and assassinate him. So everything changed and it became the you have to own the high ground. Clearly, in this instance, Mike, that didn't happen.